Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about everything and anything at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach, Reiki master, intuitive counselor, and above all, an inquisitive soul. Since my early childhood, I've been on the quest to find out how life really works. And the best clue I've got so far is the sacred alchemy of physics and metaphysics, science and spirituality, mind, body and spirit, which together reveal the truths we all want to know. Who am I? Why am I here? What is life all about? How can I live my life to realize my highest potential with fulfillment, prosperity and joy? How can I manifest what I want? I'd love to share with you on this podcast what I have learned over the years and bring you inspiring conversations with my guests who will share their expertise as well. So sit back, relax and enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. If you loved my recent interviews with Dr. Helene Wabe about the science of channeling, with Stefan Schwartz about the secrets of remote viewing, and with Dr. Dean Radin about the real magic, I promise you, you will love this one. We are going deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole, wanting to discover the real nature of reality, if I can put it this way, which is pulling us into the unknown, past the point of no return. But don't freak out just yet. (laughs) The rabbit hole I'm talking about is the portal to a higher level of consciousness, and we must go deeper on our journey in order to get to the higher level of understanding. That's the quantum paradox. The bottom of the deepest rabbit hole is the peak of the highest mountain. (laughs) even if I say so myself. So I won't say, sit back and relax. I will say, fasten your seatbelts and enjoy the ride. Today's episode is about the unified nature of reality, which is both a simple and a very complex concept. And so I searched for a top expert in this field to talk about this with on my podcast. My special guest is Dr. Jude Curivan. Jude Curivan, PhD, is a cosmologist, futurist, planetary healer, author, member of the Evolutionary Leader Circle, and previously one of the most senior international businesswomen in the UK. She has a master's degree in physics from Oxford University, specializing in quantum physics and cosmology and a PhD in archaeology researching ancient cosmologies from the University of Reading in the UK. Jude has traveled to over 80 countries, worked with wisdom keepers from many traditions, and is a lifelong researcher into the nature of reality. She is the author of seven books. The most recent ones, and both award-winning, are the best-selling The Cosmic Hologram and The Story of Gaia. In 2017, Jude co-founded Whole World View with the aim to serve the understanding, experiencing and embodying of unitive awareness to empower conscious evolution. And now, while based in the UK, Jude joins me from Portugal. Hello Jude, welcome to Quantum Living. It's a pleasure and honor to have you on my show. Anna, it's my pleasure to be with you. And I'm so delighted that I'm in wonderful company with my with my friends, Stefan and Dean and Helene, as well as yourself and all the folks who are with us today. <laughs> Thank you so much. Gosh, your work, your books are so rich with so much great information and ideas. And there is so much I would like to cover in this conversation. Let's start with your personal journey. 
which you share in your books, of course. So just could you please briefly set the scene for this conversation with how you got to this point in your life and work? <laughs> it's, a, it's a scenic route, Anna. Um, it's been a route of curiosity. When I was four years old, I began to experience reality um, in ways that are beyond the sort of the, the physical realm of our universe. Uh, like Stefan that you mentioned earlier and Helene, I've had uh, what Dean would describe as supernormal experiences since very early childhood. And for me, from that very early age, they've not just been natural, but they've been an integral um, part, a fundamental part of, of my ongoing journey. So beginning from that point, um, it's been a, 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 a quest of curiosity, curiosity about the nature of the world, our place in it, especially when I was having these experiences, which were not the worldview that uh, I was educated in and, and science was telling us about. So that journey took me to Oxford, as you mentioned, uh, because I was curious as to how my experiences were being taught in terms of science. And the reality of it, they weren't. <laughs> so my ongoing journey has been, well, you know, what is the nature of, of the deeper sense of reality? And how can I, just from that place of curiosity, discover more about it? And what does that mean, not just for myself, but what it might mean for us collectively? So I went through a period of time in international corporate life. I did a PhD in ancient cosmologists because I wanted to understand how the ancients saw their place in the world and the world around them, um, as well as the, the scientific basis. And I also went around the world and learned from many, many traditional wisdom keepers on their perspective, from an indigenous point of view, from an ancient wisdom point of view. And really, my work brings all of this together. And now the leading edge of science is actually converging with those universal wisdom teachings. So it's been a wonderful, a wonderful lifelong quest of curiosity to this point, and it's ongoing. And it just feels that our timing, uh, our conversation now is really key because this is something that can now be really shared with the whole world. Beautiful. Now, you put forward a significant premise in your book, The Cosmic Hologram, that information is more fundamental in the creation than matter, energy, space or time. So I would like to open our conversation with a question about information, which I would like to elaborate on a bit to give you a platform for an informed reply as well as for some speculation as there are several intersecting aspects to it. What is information and how it was created in the first place, from the instructions for the composition of the stars to the coding of the human DNA? Is information consciousness with a big C? Can we create new information, or is it a fixed primordial element of creation, and so everything we come up with or come across is simply the recycled data circulating in the quantum field. For example, we assume, or perhaps we know, that all subatomic particles that exist today were created in the Big Bang. There is a finite amount of them, and so we are breathing in the same air that creatures and beings living millions of years ago <laughs> were breathing in and out. And so if we apply this principle to information, is there anything new under the sun? Is every thought, idea, invention, insight, design, book, poem, song, dream, imagination, the recycled information rather than of our original creation? That is a great question. And it was beautifully stated and asked, Anna. So thank you for that. Um, first of all, what is information? And obviously, with our technologies now, we are very familiar that we use information. We talk about information all the time. And we wouldn't be able to have this conversation were not our communications technologies able to take my voice and translate it into digital strings 
of ones and zeros. And the ones and zeros of themselves don't have any meaning, but when they're strung together, they effectively translate my words in English in a way that then can be squirted down a cable and bounced off a satellite and into your laptop and and, and retranslated then into those words and vice versa. We can do the same with images. We can look at, we can take images of an object and we can translate the, the information into those digitized uh, those digitized long strings that then again can be squirted down a cable off a satellite and into each other's laptops. So we're very familiar with our communications technologies and much else of this sense of information. Now, let's take a step bigger than us. Because what we're understanding now, what we're discovering now, and this is now at all scales of existence, I write about in in those two books you mentioned, and across many, many different fields of research, is that first of all, the appearance of our universe, its energy and matter and space and time, aren't its most fundamental reality. The fundamental reality of our universe, which is non-physical, is itself formed of meaningful, and I really want to stress that word, meaningful information. And it too is expressed in those digits of ones and zeros. We can come round again on this because we know this from many, many different studies. And we, as cosmologists, looking at the whole universe, are now putting together a framework for how this all fits together so that the appearance of our universe is essentially arises from digitized, meaningful information, which is why I always put a little dash between the in and the formation to really stress its meaning. Because the, the everything in existence that arises from these deeper realms of causation has meaning and intrinsic purpose. And we can go back to that later. But just to say that, how does that happen? And why does it happen? And what does it mean? Um, Our universe, more and more, we're coming to the realization that our universe is a finite entity. It began 13.8 billion years ago. It obviously is, uh, will continue for some, probably billions of years to come, but it is not infinite. It is a finite entity. And we're realizing that beyond our universe, there may be many universes we don't know, but beyond our universe, it's as though it's more a finite thought in the infinite and eternal mind of the cosmos. Because what we're coming down to with this understanding of information being more foundational than how it appears in terms of energy, matter, and space time, and because it's intrinsically meaningful, we're essentially beginning to see how the infinite and eternal mind of the cosmos can create our universe. And it does so in the form of digitized information because that's the simplest. I mean, if you think about our English language, we have 26 letters, yeah? Some languages are as short as 12 letters. Some are much bigger than the English language. Our universe manages to create all that we call the nature of of universal reality from just two letters, ones and zeros. Now, let's go into deeper than that. So what I'm saying is that our universe is a creation of cosmic mind and exists and evolves as a unified entity meaningfully and purposefully. Now, you talk about not being able to create new information. Let's go back to what you were saying about energy and matter, because you're absolutely right. The way that cosmic universal information essentially creates the appearance of our universe, it does so in two complementary ways. As quantized energy and matter, which is fixed, from the very first moment of our universe's birth 13.8 billion years ago to its end. As you say, it just changes its form, but it is fixed. 
Okay. The hydrogen in our bodies is almost as, and, and the water of, of our planetary home and ourselves is, is literally only a few moments younger than the entire universe. But nonetheless, all the energy matter in our universe is what's called conserved and just changes form. So the information that is expressed as energy matter indeed is neither created nor destroyed. It's, on, it's, it's there for the whole journey, as it were, just changing in form. But that's not the end of the story because information also expresses itself in a complementary way a space and time. And that's what changes. Because if we go back to that first moment of our universe, it began in its most minute state, incredibly fine-tuned, wonderfully ordered, tiny, and not as a big bang. It wasn't big, we know that. But it wasn't a chaotic bang. It was the first moment of what I describe as an ongoing big breath. And this is key. Because from that moment, ever since, space has expanded and time has flowed forward. And what that has enabled is our universe to evolve. Because energy matter is conserved throughout time, throughout space and time. That enables our universe to exist. But the ability of space to expand and time to flow forward means that more and more information can be expressed, experienced, evolved within our universal story because there's greater capacity for it to do that. And so you need both. You need information expressed as quantized energy matter, conserved, and you also need, we need, our universe has information expressed, not quantized, but a space-time. And that's called entropic. And the reason for that is a space expands and time flows. Uh, entropy can be restated as the informational content of our universe. So as, as all of this happens, the entropy of space-time, the entropy of our universe, the information content increases in every moment from that very first moment 13.8 billion years ago till now so that's why we need and both and Mm, beautiful answer. Thank you. There is a school of thought, and I believe that Greg Braden may have been speaking about this, on how a new universe is created in the multiverse, if we accept the concept of a multiverse, which makes perfect sense to me, that once a universe has reached its informational capacity, which apparently is finite, as you said, the pressure creates a break in its outer membrane, which we might perceive as a Big Bang, spitting out a new universe with that excess information, like a balloon emerging from another balloon, after which the old universe may or may not die. But even this theory, even if it explains how a new universe is created and how universes multiply in the multiverse, the key question still remains, how did the original universe, the mother of all the universes, if you like, come into being and why? What do you think? <laughs> well, first of all, I, th I don't think it's a question that we can answer. Mm. Uh, as, as, you know, in our human forms, in our human sense of awareness, can you envisage infinity? Can you envisage eternity? No. Quite. We can speculate. Uh, we can speculate, but I guess for me, the most important point is, and, and, and I, I know that Greg would agree with this. Uh, and by the way, I, I feel that his hypothesis, his speculation is, is, you know, could well be right. 
there's another way of looking at it that in supermassive black holes, for example, that we have at the centre of most, if not all, originating galaxies in our universe, that the conditions inside those may also enable a budding off, as it were, of new universes. So, you know, there are ways in which our finite universe, um, rather like a balloon, because space we know is continuing to expand, um, may come. And, and, and the reason I'm saying this is that there's a third part of this whole uh, puzzle, as it were, which is that the very beginning of space time, space was at its hottest. It was at its what's called a Planck scale temperature. And its entropy or its informational content was at its, its least. As space has expanded and times flow, the temperatures dropped and the information contents increased. So we can actually make a calculation of how long our universe is likely to continue until the temperature drops to zero or almost zero. And as Greg said, and you're just saying, Anna, and the informational content is at a maximum. So we can, we can actually, you know, look forward and, and, and perceive that. And then what happens after that, it could well be that as our universe, almost like a cosmic bubble, just dissipates back into the infinite and eternity of cosmic mind, and or some of that information may then be birthed into a, a, a succeeding universe, um, which is in my view, quite likely because our universe is so incredibly fine-tuned and in, in such relational perfection, exquisite ordering, that it suggests very much that it's a it's a it's a successor universe of 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 others. Um so I think we can speculate about that. But I guess for me the more important point is is you know our universe and its journey to here. And a realization that we stand on its bow wave of potential for further evolution. And so, you know, what do we do about that? You know, where are we? How are we? Why are we? And what do we do about that? Yes. So is information consciousness with a big C? And is there such a thing or place as non-consciousness or non-existence? I would suggest, that, thank you for reminding me, because you did ask that in your question. Um, what I would say is that the evidence, and, and of course this also comes from universal wisdom teachings, is that essentially mind and consciousness aren't something we have. They are literally what we and the whole world are. So what we're talking about here is cosmic consciousness, cosmic mind. I mentioned that earlier, cosmic mind, because, you know, the definitions of consciousness are very slippery, as I'm sure, you know, we're all aware. Um, and therefore, I tend to say mind and consciousness, because then it's that sort of fundamental nature of mind with consciousness being different levels of self-awareness. And we're speaking of a universe that the evidence is suggesting is intrinsically conscious as an emergent thought from the infinite and eternal mind of the cosmos. So yes, and it does so as consciousness expressing itself as meaningful information, using those two letters for its language of ones and zeros, but from which everything we call our universe and everything we, within it is comprised. So the appearance of our universe is fundamentally universal information, meaningful information, and that whole story begins with the infinity and eternity of cosmic mind deciding to have a great thought. And going back to that first thought, I'm not able to answer that. But what wonderful, what a wonderful, wonderful cosmic cornucopia of possibility 
Yes. And I would like to explore a bit further this cornucopia of possibilities, even with some existential questions. I mean, the, the whole nature of our conversation, obviously, is while it is based on science and a lot of scientific evidence that you so beautifully outline in your books, I guess for our listeners, there are key elements of it that they might want to look at how they could apply it in their daily lives. So the, the questions are, and, and I have few of those, how we can utilize this knowledge, even if it's just speculation and theory, how we can utilize it in our daily lives at a practical level. And uh, one leading point to that is the importance of understanding, and I will wave in a little bit of physics here, but obviously I may get some te technical details wrong, so please feel free to correct me. I'm just doing my best based on my own understanding. So let's talk about the importance of our understanding that the subparticles carrying information exist in the quantum field in the so-called superposition state, meaning they they are being both wave and particle until they are observed. So this is the key point here. And at that point, or at some point, when this observation effect has reached a critical mass, they collapse into a particle which can manifest in our physical reality. In your book, you take this concept much further as you talk about this superposed state of information as qubits or quantum bits, which then become digitized bits of information or combinations of zeros and ones, which then can realize in the material world. So my question is, and my point here is, that the act of observation of a certain future event, for example, which is just information in, in the quantum field, can be, I assume, an intention, an intense thought charged with emotion, which then collapses that superposition state, eventually manifesting our intention into our physical reality. So could you please speak to this from both the quantum physics perspective, how this really works, and then offer, if you can, some practical insights into how we can best utilize this knowledge to the extent that we can understand it in the process of manifesting the changes we want in our life. Okay, well, let's, um, let's just go right back to the beginning, if we may, Anna, of that, because you said, you know, how speculative and theoretical this is. This isn't speculative. Um, what we now have is the best evidence, scientific evidence that what we're sharing today or what I'm sharing today is the, certainly the direction of travel of the best understanding we yet have. So it's not, it's not so speculative in the way that we were describing how universes, you know, bud off and all the rest of it. That is speculation at the moment. This is not speculation. This is based on all the laws of physics we've known for decades and centuries. It's also based on quantum physics and relativity physics. But just as the, those two 20th century innovations and pioneering understanding expanded on the science of Newton in really absolutely vital ways, what now is coming forward is expand them further. It's not throwing them out. It's not throwing Newtonian physics out. It's just saying we're going deeper. You talked about rabbit hole, but we're going deeper and deeper into the fundamental nature of reality. And the scientific evidence now is what's supporting this 21st century revolution. And this 21st century revolution, although it's based on scientific evidence across many fields of research, as I mentioned, and literal scales of existence, it's also converging with universal wisdom teachings. But unlike the 20th, 20th century science of the quantum world and relativity physics, this is playing out on the scale of our everyday lives. You know, we're finding the same informational patterns underlying what we call our universe's, uh, you know, appearance. But we're finding those same underlying patterns of 
meaningful information at every scale. We're seeing the same patterns underlying ecosystems and underlying the internet. We're seeing the same patterns underlying the, the sort of frequency and power of earthquakes and the frequency and destructive power of human conflicts. You know, that they're, they're playing out in our behaviors, our collective behaviors. And of course, at that deeper level that you described, they're playing out in the choices we make and the intentions we have. So I want to come back into, into that. So first of all, I would say this, what we're sharing is eminently practical because it's not out there. It literally is in here and it's around us and it's at every scale of how, you know, we are with ourselves, with each other, with our planetary home, with our whole world. So, you know, it, it, I talk about acting local from this understanding, feeling global and thinking cosmic because it's all part of this unified level of awareness. So it is practical. It's eminently practical. And we can come back to that. The other thing you're talking about is um, the superposition, the quantum superposition of, of energy matter, essentially, until it's observed. But the question is then, who is the observer? Because we often look at this from the perspective of human consciousness. Yeah, What I'm talking about here is universal consciousness, a universe that exists and evolves whether we're here or not, where we are its microcosmic co-creators and have the ability because we're part of its unified reality as Hel Helena will talk about and, 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 and Dean and, and Stefan and others will talk about and I too, we have the ability naturally to tune into that unified awareness but we're not the whole, but we are a, a whole on of it because the other thing in this whole model going forward is that our universe's appearance is literally a holographic projection from the boundary of what we call space-time. And like a hologram, the wholeness is in every part, and every part is part of the whole. But who is the observer? And what I would suggest is we begin with a universe that is not just unified, but self-aware, living, conscious. So the observer ultimately is the whole universe. And in that regard, when we talk about the experiments we do from a perspective of human consciousness um, and observe, it, it's how we measure. You're absolutely right, but it's how we measure. And often how we measure gives an illusion of separation. And what we understand, both from a theoretical perspective that's over 100 years old, is that our universe exists and evolves as a non-locally unified entity. Otherwise, quantum physics, quantum behavior couldn't occur at all without that underlying wholeness for the literally the whole of our universe. And to now say that this is not speculation at all is that the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2022, just a couple of months ago, was given to three researchers who have studied the universal non-locality of our universe for many, many decades. And the Nobel Prize for Physics is only given for what's called settled science. So we're now moving into, I think, an incredibly exciting time when not only will we understand what we've just been sharing, but also the fundamental reality that mind and consciousness are what we have. They're literally what we in the whole world are. And therefore, as you mentioned, we can use our intention. We can align and attune with, you know, the, 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 the highest purpose and well-being of who we naturally are, rather than this illusion of separation, to literally consciously evolve into the wholeness, the whole being of who we are. But that still means we're still microcosms, conscious co-creators of a conscious universe. If I intend that the laws of physics shall change, personally, I don't 
believes that any of us are capable of doing that. But what you're talking about and what Dean and Helene and, and Stefan are talking about does not violate the laws of physics when we understand them at this deeper informational level. Nothing that we all share violates that journey of our universe, which within space-time has this causality that goes from you know, that first moment 13.8 billion years ago. No supernormal phenomena, in my understanding and research, violates causality within space-time. What it does do is enable us to be aware of the wholeness and the unified nature of our universal journey. So in this case, doesn't this ongoing observation by the universe of itself in its totality, doesn't it negate the concept of our intention collapsing the wave of possibility into a particle of matter. If this process is ongoing, is our focus intention simply an additional input to this process that precipitates it? Or what's the relationship between the two? Well, first of all, if we go back 13.8 billion years, that is the moment, the first moment of that flow of time moving forward and space expanding and therefore the ability of our universe to evolve. And as it evolves, it also individuates its consciousness into greater levels of self-awareness and complexity. Yeah? So we've We've been on a journey for our conversation has been on a journey that's 13.8 billion years in the making, but it's not either deterministic, nor does it take away any of our agency in terms of our being such microcosms of our universe and its awareness and its, in its mind and its consciousness. So we literally stand now on the bow wave here and now on the bow wave. The past is behind us. We're here and now in the present. But that bow wave, as Dean's researched, is also rather like, and I describe it as a bow wave, because if you've ever seen a ship moving across a sea or, or a boat across a, a pond, you'll see that right at the front of the prow, there's a sort of a you know, uh, 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 literally a bow wave, yeah? And so in a sense, we are standing at the bow wave of possibility, which doesn't change the laws of physics. It doesn't change the, the, the timeline of causality, but it does bring then into the here and now the level of tension and possibility that we, our consciousness is capable of manifesting. And the more that we move forward and consciously evolve, I would suggest, given that we are naturally able to experience supernormal phenomena, then our powers of intention, our powers of group consciousness, I feel, and the ability to, and the, 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 I hope the naturalization of multidimensional communications is something that more and more becomes part of all of our lived experience. It doesn't change the laws of physics. What it does do is actually expand our awareness into a universal level of awareness that's already existing and continuing to evolve. Beautiful. When we make a choice or decision, and this is one of my burning questions, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> that I ask every expert I, I can, and uh, obviously there are different views on that. When we make a choice about anything, is it our free will to pick one of the many possibilities 
in the quantum field at that point in time? Or is our choice already predestined? And uh, there are there have been experiments done with subjects whose brain was reacting emotionally two seconds before they were shown a particular photo designed to evoke a specific emotion. So to put simply, does the universe already know what choice or decision we will make? And I guess there is a link to our spiritual self as a soul, and and we'll, we'll come back to that. So does the universe already know what choice or decision we will make as it is already pre-programmed or are we having free will as we go, so to speak, (laughs) or both? Actually, I like your and both. It's an interesting question. Um, The the work that's been done, I know Dean's done some of this work himself, about this sense of um, the two-second ahead sort of, uh, you know, the two-second ahead period. Mm -hmm. That's why I speak of a bow wave. Yeah. Because there is that sort of, that sort of possibility wave in front of us that our, our bodies or our, our sense isn't yet aware of. Yeah. So I think with mm-hmm. the bow wave and, and that level of possibility, I don't think there's anything in the laws of physics that would negate that. However, I would also say there is nothing in the laws of physics that actually is deterministic in terms of the future other than the laws of physics themselves. You know, the laws of our universe have been in place from the, from the beginning, 13.8 billion years ago. They're extraordinarily fine-tuned, beautifully relational. They work. They literally have essentially created a perfect universe for the, for, for not just to exist, but to evolve from its innate originating simplicity to ever greater levels of complexity and diversity and self individuated self-awareness. So they are, they're along for the journey. They're along for the cycle, the life cycle, the life story of our universe. But as I mentioned, as time has flowed from that first moment and space expanded, we're now on the bow wave where, you know, the, the choices that we make about our future are not yet made. They're not deterministic. And yet they play out within the appearance of our universe. Yeah? So, for example, if we had an intention that we would become, uh, we would change our human form to become a bird, we can imagine that. But I don't, I would suggest we can't manifest that in the, in the, in the nature of what we call physical reality but we can imagine it. And that is what's so beautiful because we can, we can actually have the both and of, of that potentiality, but within what we call the, you know, within what we call our universe as reality, the appearance of energy, matter, and space time, the past is the past. It's a story told that leads to this point and the future will be a continuing journey of the life cycle of our universe, but our choices for us are not determined. We do have free will, I would suggest. And yet, the more that we actually come into alignment and conscious alignment with what some call our higher selves, you know, there are many terms for this. In my experience, when we do that, we find ourselves allowing what is our higher purpose, as it were, to flow through us. And our choices change. And our sense of almost separation dissolves. So who is the who is the being that is actually embodying free will? And in that sense, you know, the expanded sense of, of self beyond the ego and beyond the, the perception of separation. Yeah. becomes aligned and attuned far more with what I describe as the evolutionary flow of the universe. And it makes a lot of sense. Now, there is a spiritual school of thought which says that every time we make a choice and we choose one path versus many others, at that point in time, those other pathways come into being, if you like, as different timelines. 
So, for example, just to give it a practical example, if we are uh, thinking and deciding, okay, I want to move to another country and I might want to move to Australia or to New Zealand or to US, so I have several possibilities and I choose one of those and I move to that country. The question is, are other timelines of my existence in those moving to those all those other countries, which I didn't choose, do they come into being and live their own lives, if you like? Or doesn't the universe have not so much the capacity, the universe has capacity for everything, but it's not aligned with the overarching architecture of the cosmos? I, I think the latter. I mean, you know, in my experience and understanding, that is a, it's a great speculation, but I don't think there's any evidence for that. And, and I, I would just refer back to what I call, not I call, but sometimes called Occam's razor. And Occam's razor is also described in a different way by Einstein, who says, the world is as simple as it can be, but no simpler. And I add, to undertake its evolutionary purpose. So what you're describing is complexity that we have, as far as I'm aware, we have no evidence whatsoever for. It's a complexity that isn't required to actually describe our universe as it is. So we have both the absence of, in, you know, the absence of evidence in that regard, but we also have sort of evidence of absence in the sense that, you know, the universe doesn't need that possibility to undertake its incredible journey um, of the last 13.8 billion years. Um, so it's a great sci-fi speculation and we can have lots of fun with it. But I'm not, I'm not aware of any evidence whatsoever for it. And there are lots of reasons why it wouldn't be the case. Mm. So can we juxtapose the concept of the soul journey? So looking at the spiritual aspect of our being with the physical cosmos. Yeah. Because when I mentioned those different timelines, that's part of the soul evolution, as I understand it, of the soul journey. So we, we might be talking about past lives, concurrent lives, future lives, various existences in various forms in, in various dimensions. So what I'm curious about is how would you juxtapose the soul journey, the spiritual concept of our existence, of our being and our purpose? in this and other incarnations with the consciousness and physicality of the universe and the cosmos? Well, first of all, what I would suggest is, is that our universe exists and evolves as a unified entity, which is what we're talking about, as a unified and finite entity, and also in its multidimensionality. In other words, the physical realm, the appearance of our physical realm is not the sole realm of vibrationary consciousness that exists and evolves along with our universe. So naturalizing communications and engagement and awareness of multidimensional realms of sentience, I feel is really important for us. You know, as, as a human species, we've, we've experienced such um, phenomena, you know, as long as we've got any sort of perspective and, and records of or, or, or just stories to share. And I think more and more, um, you know, as we expand our awareness and as we go through this possibility of conscious evolution, naturalizing those multidimensional experiences is, I feel, foundational for us going forward. What that may mean in terms of different realms of, of existence, experience, exploration, I feel we're just at the beginning of really as a, as a species, as a collective consciousness. So I don't certainly want to sort of say, oh, yes, oh, no, on all of this, because I don't know. I can only share my own experiences from the age of four of these multidimensional realms and of, you know, my memories of, of other lives going into what I would say that the timeline of our universe. What I haven't had is, um, direct experience of timelines that 
you know, in any way would violate that causality, that path of causality from the very beginning of our universe to this point. Okay. So and yet I've had other experiences that have not exactly intersected this realm of existence and where time, the percent, the, the perspective of time is very different. So I'm very open to, you know, the adventure. <laughs> what we might discover. But as a cosmologist, I also would say that unless I'm, I, unless I can see some evidence, and I have seen no evidence in nearly over 65 years of exploration, that there is a violation within that whole path of our universe's story um, that, that comes together in this incredibly beautiful way that enables us, you know, after after all this time to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. But I'll leave it there because, you know, uh, there may be come tomorrow or 10 minutes from now, somebody says, well, here's the evidence. Um, as, as yet, <laughs> um, and I don't feel we, I don't feel that's necessary. It goes back to this as simple as it can be, but no simpler to undertake its evolutionary purpose. But it's beautiful and that we have these multidimensional realms of of um, coexisting sentience. Yes, and speaking of the of the journey of discovery, I remember reading reading an interesting point. It was many years ago. Someone said that the moment the real nature of life and the universe and all that is is discovered, everything will disappear and will start from scratch. So, in other words. There is an implied notion that we cannot really discover and find out and learn about everything and understand the universe and life in their totality. There is, I think, an interesting element of some truth in it. What do you think in terms of the journey rather than arriving? I love the journey and I agree. I, I feel this is an ongoing journey. Um, and now it feels that it's whilst it's a journey that we've never journeyed to this point before, it does feel that the last couple of centuries where our worldview has moved more and more um, into a, a perspective of materiality and separation. And then in that sense, we've we sort of dismembered our psyche from those, those mm. that, that the wholeness that we're now, you know, that ancient traditions spoke of and now the you know the leading edge of science is bringing us to this realization of wholeness of unity in diversity um and i think that it's an ongoing journey just as you know the newtonian uh, framework that didn't, didn't give way actually to the quantum framework and the relativity framework because all our structures all our organizations you know, whether it's our education, whether our, it, whatever it might be, it's still based on a mechanistic worldview. So, you know, we're now in the possibility of sort of, because we, quantum physics and relativity physics gave us fundamental clues of what we're now sharing, even they of themselves were not enough to take us to this point in our journey of, you know, what we're sharing today. Of a, of a conscious, mindful, informed, holographic, non-locally unified universe, multidimensional, that multidimensionally exists and evolves, yeah, purposefully and meaningfully. But it's still an ongoing journey. And you know, that beautiful comment you made, Anna, is still speculation. I would say nobody knows, yeah. <laughs> you know, but I would say we've probably got a heck of a long journey ahead of us before we do. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Speaking of holograms, in your book, you made a very interesting point talking about holograms and holographic universe, that the holographic characteristics 
are ideal for the recording, storage, processing and retrieval of information both on the distributed basis and non-locality. Do you know whether we already have such a technology or someone is perhaps working on it? And would a holographic computer be more powerful than a quantum computer? I don't think they're one in the same, but I do feel that again, you know, holograms are still human holograms are still, what, half a century old in their earliest forms. Again, we've got so much potential to to explore. But yes, the very nature, and of course, it's all about the attributes of light, of electromagnetic radiation, which is the perfection for it. We're just using it in our technologies. But it's the universal attributes of electromagnetism that are perfect for all the things that you uh, you just spoke of. Um, and so, yes, I think, you know, we've got a long, long, long way to go in terms of um, developing holographic technologies. Um, what they seem to be better for, not so much about calculation, because quantum computers are calculators. They're just very, very, very efficient calculators because of the superimposed state of the information as qubits. Yeah. But holograms are just perfect for giving us a three-dimensional appearance from a two-dimensional pattern of information. You know, whether it's it's a hologram of an apple or in London now, we have the holographic concert of ABBA, which is extraordinary. So, but they seem, that seems to be what holograms are just wonderful for. With all of those attributes of informational capacity to create a three-dimensional appearance from a two-dimensional boundary, as it were. And that's what our universe is. Yes. Is there such a thing as consensus reality? And how can you reconcile our subjective realities projected inside our brain and through our personal filters with the objective reality we all interact with more or less in the same way? I, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both and. And one of my friends, um, Max Vellmans, Professor Max Vellmans, talks about reflexive monism. So Max talks about the sort of the unified nature of reality and the wholeness of our universe as a great thought, yeah? A self-aware, living, evolving, mm-hmm. sentient being. And we are its individuated, or one of its, one of its many, 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 many individuated microcosmic co-creators of sentience. So we've evolved to the point where we can have that sort of subjective perspective, you know, the inner dreams, the inner, um, obviously the thoughts, but, but the imagination. And we can have consensus reality. If we can't have consensus reality, I don't yeah. see how we could have this conversation. <laughs> True. I mean, you know, you can really yeah. go down a rabbit hole and <laughs> never end if you... Yeah. Yes, absolutely. What is time in your view? In my view, time, the time of our universe began, as we've said, at 13.8 billion years ago. And what I write about in my books, but it is really based on the best cosmological and and, and very widespread science, including neuroscience, but way beyond that, is that as as our universe began in that first moment, in its most minute moment, what it did was it, it's called the Planck era, P-L-A-N-C-K, named after Max Planck, one of the great pioneers of quantum physics. And the beauty, going back to consensus perspective, is that when we look at our universe, um, there are five measures of energy and matter and space and time and temperature, which literally drop out. When we put the laws of physics together, these, these measures just drop out. And they drop out in a way that they are, the, the, the units are irrelevant, whether we measure them in, for example, time, whether we measure it in seconds or years or gobbledygooks. You know, we could, we could put any name to it and any, um, measure to it. But the Planck scale is where the reality of our universe comes into being. 
So, for example, the the measure of length, the pixelation, as it were, of the information is minute. It's as small to an atom as the atom is the whole universe. But there's a Planck measure of time, and that is 10 to the minus 44 seconds. It's, again, absolutely minute. But if we go back to that first moment of space and time, and we'll put energy and matter to the side for the moment because this is the real thing. In each Planck scale moment, our universe expands. And therefore, in each Planck scale moment, that expansion enables ever more information to be expressed within space-time, as space-time itself and on its boundary. So time, in that sense, is the accumulation of the informational content. Makes sense. It's time that enables our universe to evolve. Without time, our universe can exist because energy and matter, quantized energy and matter, don't care about time. They don't care about uh, an arrow of time. They do their job perfectly. They are conserved But space-time is not. Space-time is entropic. The past is has less informational content than the present. The present has less informational content than what the future will unfold. That is why there's an arrow of time, because it's an arrow of entropy, which is the informational content of our universe, increasing at every Planck moment from that first moment 13.8 billion years ago. So that is how I would describe time. That's beautiful. I've never heard this sort of description of time, and it does make such sense that time is information in a way that you have described. It makes so much sense. So thank you. (laughs) (laughs) I hope that this will help people, or some of us, to have a better grip on the concept of time, which is so elusive. Some say, oh, it's another, it's a fourth dimension, it's a flow of energy. But the way you've described it, that it is a flow of information and it is necessary for the evolution of the universe because the amount of information grows. This makes so much, so much sense. So thank you. I'm loving it. You're welcome. Just to add to that, because you added about a fourth dimension, and that's important. And this is where Einstein's genius was so key, because what he realized is that for an observer, if you just measure an event in space, if you have two different observers, because space is relative, they'll make two different measures. Equally, if different observers measure an event just in time, again, because time is relative to an observer, they'll measure it in different ways. What he realized is you have to bring space and time together as space-time. And when you do that, you can then tell a story, a consensus story, and from the very beginning of our universe. But then any observers, as long as they actually measure an event with three dimensions of space and one of time, in other words, they they describe the space-time attributes of an event, they'll always agree. And that's called invariance. And that's how our universe can exist and evolve. Because without that invariance, we'd be all over the place. The laws of physics will be different. You know, there wouldn't be the ability to have a, a consensus reality. But because space and time are conjoined in this way, as space expands as time flows, the entire universe can not just exist, but as we're saying, evolve into ever greater levels of complexity and and individuated self-awareness. Beautiful. Now, Jude, uh, time is catching up with us, unfortunately. We have have a few minutes left. Let's talk for a moment about the unified reality and your whole worldview initiative which has its own website. And by the way, I will include all the links to your online presence and your beautiful books in the show notes. Could you please tell us about this initiative, Whole World View Initiative? What is its purpose? And how is it different from the New World Order, which is a well-known and somewhat controversial 
concept, as you may be aware. And by the way, interestingly, <laughs> when I when I was um, preparing this conversation, creating your the cover for the podcast, I caught myself writing in several places the unifying nature of reality rather than the unified nature. So my brain was reading the unifying nature of reality, which is perhaps an interesting maybe Freudian flip <laughs> in my in my brain. But yes, I, this this um, website and, and Facebook group, I believe, Whole World View Initiative, what is it and how is it different from the New World Order? Well, first of all, it's nothing to do with New World Order and it's nothing like New World Order. It came because when um, when the Cosmic Hologram was published in 2017, there was a sense of a group of us that were working around it and, and helping with the launch to really hope that it could serve the understanding, experiencing and embodying of what we call unitive awareness. In other words, a reality, an understanding that we're not separate an understanding that we literally are inseparable, that we are, again, microcosmic co-creators of, of, of a, a universe that exists and evolves in its wholeness as a living, as a living sentient being within the cosmos. So because our worldview collectively has been one of materialism and separation with all of the behaviors and all of the consequences that's resulted from that. The whole worldview hopes to show the evidence that turns that upside down so that instead of coming from a perception of separation, we come from a, a knowingness, a deep, profound sense of whole being and belonging, yeah, with the whole world. And of course, its unity is not uniformity. Its unity is radical diversity. We've only got to look at our beautifully planet beautiful planetary home and see that, you know, no snowflake is the same. You know, no leaf is the same. <laughs> this is a universe that revels in abundance and diversity and possibility. Um, it really is so beautiful. So, you know, the story, the and a, a, a narrative, a, a, we've told narratives, we shared narratives that help you know, offer us meaning and purpose to our journey of human, as human beings, you know. And what this is, is a new narrative, a unitive narrative of a universe that's innately meaningful and evolutionary purposeful. So we are, so we belong, you know, we're co-creators of this glorious evolutionary journey um, that's ongoing. And, and, you know, if we can wake up to remember we're inseparable, what an incredible adventure we could have ahead of us. So in essence, the unified nature of reality is unifying. Yes. From this perspective. Yes. The slip of a tongue it's, wasn't really that bad. <laughs> it wasn't bad at all. It was wonderful. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's almost like remembering um, it, it's it's this process. It's this onward journey. So unifying, yes, yeah. but it's always been unified. But we're we're literally waking up to remember this, uh, and we're on potentially together on this journey, this unifying journey. And so, how people can engage with with your website, with your Facebook group? Yeah, very welcome to. Um, as you say, you're going to put the the the, the website. In the notes, we do um, invite people to join our, our regular newsletters. We share a lot of resources um, around, you know, not just what we're doing, but also folks we know are also coming from this same sense of, of wholeness. Uh, we have a whole series of partners, global partners. So, for example, Helene and Dean and Ions are global partners for us. Uh, but we have many others and it's a growing, uh, a growing, uh, linking up and lifting up from this perspective of, of unity and diversity and what that can mean in the world. You know, how that can be transformative in, in how we are with each other, how we are with our beloved 
planetary home Gaia. So that's the best place. And and certainly to join our Facebook community if mm-hmm. folks would like to as well. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, we didn't even get a chance to talk about your most recent book, The Story of Gaia, because there was so much material in your in your previous book that I wanted to cover. So perhaps that that's for another conversation. So would you like to just give us a synopsis of The Story of Gaia? Thank you. Maybe we can arrange another call and really focus on that because if the cosmic hologram is 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 the story of our whole universe so that we can understand how it exists and evolves in the way that we shared. The story of Gaia is the evolutionary journey. So of our, our not just our, our planetary home, but you know, us. So the whole universe, our planetary home and us. Um, so the subtitle is the big breath and the and the evolutionary journey of our conscious planet. So I hope that when folks read it, they also begin or continue a journey of um discovery, inner and outer discovery, because I hope that it brings people into ever deeper relationship, you know, with ourselves, with Gaia and and with our whole universe. And I talk about big breath, as I mentioned early, because uh, earlier, because our universe began as the first moment, you know, not in a big bang, but as the first moment of an ongoing big breath and out breath yes. of possibility and potential that we're still on. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Jude. Any final thought? I mean, every thought that you have just shared with us can be <laughs> can be considered as as uplifting and, and summarizing. But is there anything else you'd like to add that you'd like to leave our audience with before we close? Thank you, Anna. There's there's just one thought really, and that's that you know our, our the old paradigm that's that's now you know we're moving beyond is one of materialism and separation, but it's also a paradigm without meaning and purpose, and ultimately it has no place for love. What this emergent understanding is offering us is of a loving universe. <laughs> a benevolent universe where we belong. So I sometimes describe what I share as the science of love, and it is evidence-based. It's it's inviting us into this profoundly loving relationship because at the most fundamental, you know, for me, I'm not talking about love as, I'm talking about love as ultimate wholeness, and interconnectedness and interbeingness, because that's how our universe is. So in that sense, our universe is indeed a loving as well as a living universe. Beautiful. Well, Jude, thank you so much for this beautiful conversation. And thank you for being on Quantum Living. It's been such a pleasure to to be speaking with you. And of course, you know, we might be continuing this conversation for many more hours, which which we can't. And so I do highly recommend those two books, which again, I will include the links to in the show notes so people can access them, purchase them, read them. They are beautiful, beautiful reading and connect with you on through your website and your Facebook group. So thank you so much, Jude. It's been such a pleasure. Anna, it's been my pleasure and delight. And maybe we can continue a conversation at some time in the future and share the story of Gaia together. Absolutely. I'd love to. All the best. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you so much. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me, and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then... Keep your vibrations high and be well.